and it is Valentine's Day. So in honor of Valentine's Day, my father asked me to speak earlier in the week and said, can I just do something on love and romance and, and whatnot? So I like to come in on Tuesday mornings, which was kind of quiet, and uh, I like to surf the net for about an hour just to get ideas or get caught up on pop culture or, or what have you. And um, he kind of told me this last Tuesday, so I went on, I looked, and it said, according to, um, I forget the, the source, but what are the top all-time Valentine's Day movie rentals or purchases or orders? And they went back years, going even back to the video days, the video rental days. I mean, if you remember those? And if you're 25 or under, you're like, what's that? We used to have to go to a building and have a membership card and order and rent movies, which was great. It wasn't so good if you were cleaning up the house like three weeks later and you found two of them sitting under some newspapers or something, because then you owed $80 on Mad Max or something, but whatever. Um, so they took that into consideration. They did Netflix, on demand, uh, hotel rentals, everything. So these were the top three of all time. Number one was Pretty Woman. Amen. How, you girls, you down with Pretty Woman? You like that movie? Yeah, Julia Roberts and Richard Gere, in case if you've never seen the movie, which is, I think it's celebrating its 25th uh, anniversary release uh, right now. Um, it was a movie about a street prostitute who <laughs> the richest man in the world falls in love with. If you were looking for it, you would look under romantic comedy. Personally, I believe it should have been under science fiction. But anyway, that's... Um, <laughs> hey, man, Pretty Woman was number one. Number two was The Notebook, a newer movie, Ryan Gosling, Rachel McAdams, The Notebook, and uh, the, the summary of that was a uh, romance that was very helter-skelter for a number of years, and an older couple that you did not know who they were, but at the end, it was the couple that you're following, and she had dementia, and he would tell, the, tell her their story every day, and at the end of the night, she would remember, and very touching, and number three was the Patrick Swayze, Demi Moore, Ghost. So in honor of the movie Ghost, I present to you this video. Go ahead, guys. So today, on behalf of Valentine's Day, I want to speak on, on romance a little bit and a great story in the Bible on romance and a couple things. First off, this is something I've done 
before, a while back, and uh, so if you've heard this before, do me a favor, for like the next, I'll go in a different slant towards the end, but for about 20 minutes, just sit there and go, hmm, that's good, Pastor Adam. Act like you've never heard it before, amen. Uh, it's also, one, a sermon that touched me 24 years ago on a Friday night. At the, we were across the street at the old building, and uh, we used to have a Friday night service, and there was about three, 400 people there on a kind of a cold, drizzly night. And my father preached this passage. I had never heard it before. I was not familiar with the, with the story that we're about to look at, but it struck me, and I'll talk a little bit about that at the end as to why, and uh, it changed my life, especially in a very down time of my life. So with that being said, I wanna talk to you about romance a little bit. And if you look up romance in the Bible, a lot of times it'll say it did not exist because marriages were arranged. And I don't know, I've read a lot of dumb statements written before, but number one, that is really dumb to say, because how many know they were human beings with a heart and affections and eyeballs and goals and desires and dreams and people fell in love, amen? Yes, marriages were arranged, but people did fall in love. And I wanna talk about that today. So we'll go with me to 1 Samuel chapter 25. A lot of scripture today, that's all right. And let's talk a little bit about love. When we pick up our story, David, we're gonna talk about David. David's in a very low point of his life. He is running for his life, literally. His father-in-law wants to kill him, okay? His father-in-law has put a bounty out on his head and is in hot pursuit of him. Saul has gotten so obsessed about David he has left all of the politics at home. He is not even governing at home. He is doing nothing but having a raiding party hunting for David. And the man's obsessed with him. David, on the other hand, must be thinking, what have I done to deserve this? In fact, I didn't ask for any of this. I was watching my father's sheep minding my own business. I didn't ever ask for Samuel to come and appoint me as the next king. And nobody believes it anyway. Everybody loved Samuel, but nobody believed when he put oil over me. One, the old king wasn't dead. Not only that, I'm not even related to him, nor am I in the lineage of the dynasty. I didn't ask for this, but yet the man of God anointed me, right? I show up at a battle and Goliath has been taunting them for 40 days and nobody's doing anything, so I go out there and I kill the big guy. Am I celebrated? No, now I'm running for my life. I didn't ask for any of this. I pray, I sing, I worship, and now I'm running for my life. He was alone, the Lord brought him 400 men at a cave in Abdullam. But the problem with that is, those 400 were all jacked up. They were in debt, they were addicted, they were dispossessed, they were homeless. So it was not the A team that was sent to him, all right? And now we pick up this. Now Samuel's dead. Huh. Don't just gloss over that. Put yourself in David's position. The one man who believed in his anointing is gone and dead. And the Israelites gathered together and they mourned for Samuel. I always wonder how did Saul feel about this? Because Saul and Samuel had gone sideways. I bet secretly on the outside, in public, Saul was very much, oh. But privately, he was given high fives. Okay? But the whole country recognized Samuel as the prophet. They buried him, Samuel that is, back at his home in Ramah. David, on the other hand, arose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. Verse two. Now there was a man in Maon, whose business was in Carmel. That's not by Pebble Beach or Monterey. That's not the, where the story's going, All right? I know it's Valentine's Day and somebody's like, ooh, Carmel on Valentine's Day. Hmm, that does sound nice. But anyway, no, this is Carmel in Israel. Uh, and the man was very rich. This man had 3,000 sheep. He had 1,000 goats. And he was shearing his sheep for the wool. You would make clothing bedding, all kinds of things, from the wool. He was shearing his sheep in Carmel. Verse three, 
The name of the man, catch this, his name was Nabal or Nabal, which in Hebrew, Semitic Hebrew of this time, literally means fool. What kind of a family names their boy fool? Can you imagine that? I want you to meet my older brother, moron, <laughs> and my little brother, we call him little dummy. I mean, what kind of family names their son? Fool, that's his name, Fool. And his wife's name was my father's joy, Abba, Abigail. That's what his name, or the name Abigail means, my father's joy. And Abigail, catch this, was a woman of good understanding. That's how the Bible says she was very intelligent. And she was of beautiful appearance. That's how the Bible says she was really hot. That's what that, <laughs> that's what that really means. She's smart and she's very attractive. She's got it going on. Unfortunately for her, she's married to a fool. But the man, the fool, he was harsh and he was evil in his doings. And he was from the house of Caleb. Next verse. Now, when David heard in the wilderness of Paran, where we last saw him, that Nabal, the fool, was shearing his sheep, David sent 10 of his men. And David said to the young men, go, go to Carmel, find Nabal, and greet him in my name. Thus you shall say to him who is rich, who lives in prosperity, say to him this, say to him, peace be to you, peace to your house, and peace to all that you have. Now I have heard, he still, this is what he's telling his young men to say, that you have, have your shearing your sheep. However, your shepherds were with us and we did not hurt them. You can go back three chapters in the Bible and there's one line that said David watched two men. Now we find out who these two men were. All right, we did not hurt them. Nor was there anything missing from them all the while that they were in Carmel. So as the sheep and the wool is growing on the sheep's bodies, you're grazing them, you're watering them, your shepherds came into an area we were in, we didn't touch nothing, we didn't take nothing. Remember, there's 600 men who have no home base because they're running for their lives, right? So when they came across a bunch, a big herd of sheep, how many of you think of the 600 thought, man, lamb chops sound really good tonight? A little rack of lamb, a little rosemary, a little mint sauce. I've been Daniel fasting for 21 days, so let me just have a moment here for a second here. All they would have do is take them. Right? There's just a handful of shepherds, unarmed. Here's four 600 armed men. It would have been no fight but they didn't touch him, okay? So therefore, remember he's still telling the young men what to say, let my young men, my messengers, find favor in your eyes, Nabal, for we come on a holiday. A holiday which says in the Old Testament, you must give to the poor, give to the needy. Perfect timing, David's thinking. Please give whatever comes into your hand, Nabal, to my servants that I'm sending to you and back to me, your son, David, okay? So when David's young men came, they spoke to Nabal according to all of these words that David had said to them in the name of David, and they waited. So Nabal answered and said, who? Who is David? Who's the son of Jesse? All right, so now he is sliding. To, how many know he knew who, who David is? The number one song on the charts in Jerusalem was Saul kills his thousands, but David kills his ten thousands. Number one. He knew exactly who David was. So now he's gonna slight David, but he's also gonna slight his ancestry. Who's the son of Jesse? Who's David and who's his daddy? <laughs> there are many servants. Oh, 
What are we talking about, a runaway slave? There's a lot of servants who break away from their master and run away. Shall I take my bread and my water and my meat that I have killed for my workers and give it to men that I don't even know anything about or where they're from? They're outlaws, they're vagabonds. They're the lowest of the low. You're asking for a gift. You guys are uh, on the most wanted list. I have plenty and they are for my workers. So when David's young men heard this, notice they don't say nothing. They turn on their heels. How many know at times when you're in the presence of a fool, it's better to keep your mouth shut? You start getting in a debate with a fool, you're gonna end up being a fool because you're having a foolish conversation. You're having a foolish argument. Amen? And notice fool does not mean ignorant. I mean, there are a lot of smart people that do foolish things. There's a lot of wealthy people that can act like a fool, right? They say nothing, they turn on their heels, and they go back, and they came and told David all of these words. Now, if you're David, you've sent the 10 out there. You gotta feed hundreds of people, you've been foraging. I mean, a roadkill could get real old, right? And I don't know about you, but I, after I've eaten one crow, I think I'm done. Right? And here's a guy with tons of provision. We have hardly anything. And I send the 10 men out. Hopefully 10 is enough to carry all that Nabal's gonna give them. Right? But instead, as they approach on from the distance, they're carrying nothing. Hmm, not good. So when David heard the words that Nabal said, what did he say to you? Well, he asked, who are you? Who's your daddy? And he called you a runaway slave. You ever done something nice for somebody and got repaid with anything but nice? Hmm? You ever thought you deserved something and you didn't get it? Might have worked your tail to the bone? Might have did all the work on that contract and somebody else came in and swooped it up? Hmm? How do you act? I don't know about you, but it's easy to get the blood boiling, right? Because look what David says. David gets the news, turns to his man and says, lock and load. Everybody grab your swords, (laughs) put them on. So every man girded on his sword. David also strapped his on, I'm going too. And about 400 men went with David. How many know that's a little bit of an overkill to kill Nabal? What, are they gonna stand in line and everybody get a thrust? <laughs> Next. I mean, this is a little bit, right? It's like throwing an atomic bomb at somebody for cutting you off on the freeway. This is overkill, right? And about 400 men went with him and 200 stayed with the supplies. He took more with him than stayed back. Now, one of the young men back at the ranch told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Abigail, David sent messengers from the wilderness to greet our master, and he, your husband, reviled them. But the men were good to us, Abigail, and we were not hurt, nor were we missing anything as long as we accompanied them in the fields. Abigail, they were a wall to us, both by night And even in the day, all the time we were with them, keeping the sheep. They watched over us, they helped us, they guarded us, right? There's a lot of modern commentaries that say David was running a protection racket. You know what a protection racket is? The mob would do this in the early 20th century. Maybe you've seen movies like The Godfather. A protection racket is the mob comes to you, you're a shopkeeper, and they say, you pay us X amount every month and we'll make sure your store never gets attacked, we'll protect it. But really, what are you paying for? You're paying for that guy not to attack you. It's extortion, right? Highly illegal. And a lot of commentaries say this is how David was financing this this ragged tag, vagabond move of his. However, there's a problem with that. 
If you're, whole, if you're keeping all of Nabal's stuff to get a, pay, a ransom and a payoff from it, David's already let them all go, right? If he's running a protection racket, he's running a lousy one, right? You've let your ransom go home. You've let all the sheep go home. I don't buy this theory at all. I think it's coincidentally the two groups met in whatever area of Israel this was in. And while they're there, David says, don't touch it, it doesn't belong to us. Even though he's got hundreds of hungry men. And why do I think that? Because David's already shown this quality when it comes to Saul. Twice he's had the opportunity to stab or kill Saul in secret like an assassin. And both times he has passed. Once even showing Saul with a, gar with a, with a part of his garment saying, look, I could have killed you, but I didn't. If somebody wanted to kill you, wouldn't it be real easy to kill them first? But David is saying, no, why? I shall not touch the Lord's anointed. If it was God who put Saul on the throne, then it has to be God that removes Saul from the throne. And if I do it, if I interject myself into this procedure, then I am taking the role of God and I shall not do it. If God anointed him as bad as he is, as crazy as he's gotten, he's seeing witches, he's, he's having soothsayers, as whacked out as he's gotten, I am not going to touch him because I know beyond a shadow of a doubt it was Samuel who also anointed me and it was God who put him on the throne. And because God did it, it will have to be God to remove it. I don't care what Samuel has poured over me or what Samuel has said to me. I cannot intervene myself into this position. So when this, all these sheep are in his area, this does not belong to me. If God will feed us, God will feed us. In fact, watch them protect them. If we have to move, we got to move. But while they're in our care, watch them. Right? So now David is mad. Gird on your swords. Let's go. Now, therefore, know and consider what you will do. For harm, Abigail, is coming to our house and is coming for your husband, our master and against all of us in his household. And, and none of us had anything to do with this. We would have helped them, but one individual, one individual is blocking the anointing in this place, right? For your husband is such a scoundrel. Interesting, how many know most servants would not, she's the lady of the house. Obviously she has a relationship with them that they're allowed to speak and speak their mind. They just called her husband a scoundrel. And I bet secretly she's like, yes and amen. But anyway, <laughs> that no one can speak to him. Notice they come to her. Why? Because you could speak to Abigail, but you can't speak to Nabal. How approachable are you? Next verse. So what does Abigail do? She hurries, makes haste. And look at the pantry this woman's got. We need to go over Abigail's house after church here because she takes 200 loaves of bread I don't know about you, but I don't have 200 loaves sitting around my house, all right? 200 loaves of bread, two skins, huge, of wine, five sheep already dressed, that does not mean an evening gown and a tuxedo. <laughs> that means they've already been slaughtered and they're ready for the Barbie, all right? Five CS, which one C is like a, like a big white painter's bucket size, so five of those, all right? of roasted grain, 100 clusters of raisins, 200 cakes of figs. She's just grabbing as much stuff as she can and she loads them on the donkeys and she says this, next verse. So she says to the servants, go, go before me, go now, go. But no, I'm coming after you, I'm coming too. But she did not tell that old fool what she was doing. So it was as she rode on that donkey that she came down under the cover of the hill and here she finds David and his men coming. Four, remember 400 of them. There's a cloud of dust, middle of the night. They're coming on their mounts. Here they come. And she met them, verse 21. And David had said, he's talking to himself as he's riding. How many know every 10 feet he's getting even more and more mad, right? Surely in vain. I protected all that that guy has in the wilderness so that nothing was missed from his belongings. And what does he do? He repays me evil for good. Oh. 
Oh, may God do, look, now he's bringing God into this. May God do so, and more even, to the enemies of me if I leave one male of all who belong to him, but I'm killing them all. That's it, I'm killing his dog. <laughs> I'm even gonna kill the grass. I'm killing his cat. If he has parakeets, I'm crushing those parakeets. If he has a koi pond, you don't even wanna know what I'm gonna do to that koi pond. I am going to kill everything. I'm gonna stab him, cut him, slice him, pull his hair, poke him in the eyes. I'm, oh, I can't, oh, oh. Whew, here we go. And this is how David and Abigail are gonna meet. And Abigail sees David. He, oh, here he comes. And what does she do? She jumps off that donkey and she falls on her face before David and bows down to the ground. My friends, this is a rich woman with servants. A rich woman with servants. I mean, this is not something she does every day. This may be something she's never done in her lifetime. She immediately falls off that donkey, runs before a man who's got vengeance on him and bows before him and totally makes herself in the most humble of positions. If you're taking notes, write this down. You will get yourself in a position that only humility will get you out of. It'll be unavoidable. And if you do nothing but have pride, you're gonna have a hard time getting past some of the obstacles in life. She jumps, falls on the ground, falls at his feet and she says, on me, on me, on me, on me, my Lord, my Lord. First word she says to David, my Lord, master. They've never met, on me, on me. Let this iniquity be. If somebody's gotta die, let it be on me right now and turn around and go home, right? Please let your maidservant, me. She's calling herself a, maid, a servant. She's a rich, wealthy woman. Let your maidservant speak into your ears and please hear the words of me, your maidservant. She says, please, please, David, let not my Lord, you, regard this scoundrel Nabal. For as his name is, what's his name? He's a fool. You know what? So he is. Nabal, fool is his name and foolish is he. That's what she just said. He can't help it. Everywhere a fool, he's named fool. Everywhere he goes, foolishness goes with him. But I, your maidservant, David, I did not see the young men that you sent. I didn't know you sent messengers. Now, therefore, my Lord, as the big Lord lives, God, and as your soul, or what's on the inside of you, David, lives, since the Lord has held you back from coming to bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your own hand. Now then, let your enemies and those who seek harm for my Lord, may they be as foolish as my foolish husband. You know, the Bible says that David was a man after my own heart, the Lord says. But how do you know David did a lot of jacked up things? But why would he have that title? Because I really believe it was because of this. David was approachable, and David was correctable. I'm finding those to be very difficult qualities in our world. More people would, even if they know they're wrong in an argument, they'll still keep fighting in that argument. Come on, bring it. All right? But David was, even when Nathan the prophet comes to him and gives him a parable, and later afterwards says, the parable is about you. David is quick to repent. I think this is the, the beauty of David. And now this present, here, all the food, all the donkeys, the cakes of figs, the raisins, the dressed sheep, the roasted grain, remember everything she brought him? <laughs> Which I brought to you, David. Let it be given to your young men who follow you, right? And please, David, please forgive the trespass of your maidservant, me. For the Lord, David, will certainly make for you, this is what my father preached on that Friday night all those years ago, an enduring house. What God wants to do with you, David, is not just for you, not just for your children, not just for your children's children, but forever. God wants to construct a house that will last forever. It'll be enduring. 
Because, why? Because you, David, fight the battles for God. And evil has not been found in you throughout your days. Yet a man, let's see if she knows history or current history, the man, a man has risen to pursue you and to seek your life. Who's she talking about? Saul. But your life, David, shall be bound in the bundle of the living with the Lord your God. And let's see if she knows about David's history. And the lives of your enemies, David, he shall sling out as from a pocket of a sling. Remember? What do we know about her already? She's beautiful and she's very smart. Can you see her intelligence in her little, as she's riding that donkey, how many knows she's already thinking what she's gonna say to him? Now, I want you to notice something else. How many times has David interrupted her while she's talking? Not once. David understands women. <laughs> Amen, huh, he's smart. Now remember, he's ready to kill. But what else do we know about her? She was beautiful. And what do we know about David? If he had one little piece of kryptonite in his life, what was it? <laughs> David liked the pretty girls, right? So he's not expecting this in the middle of the night. He's thinking how he's gonna kill this guy. And here comes this, woo, smoking hot and smart, falling at my feet and bringing all the food. Now, if you're part of David's entourage, you gotta be thinking this has been a wild trip. Number one, we have a pretty good little army here, but continually he says, do not strap on your weapons and take on Saul's army. They're really our brothers. Don't lay a finger on them. One guy slides him, we're gonna kill them all. And they're sitting there going, I'm only hungry. I want something to eat. And here comes this beautiful woman bringing everything that their heart's desire wanted. Meals, not only meals, she brought dessert. Cakes, raisins, wow. A little Cool Whip, she, I mean, it's, right? It's going on. They gotta be thinking right on, right? And it shall come to pass when the Lord has done for you, David, according to all the good that he has spoken concerning you, and then he will appoint you, David, the ruler over Israel. She's familiar with the story of Goliath. She's familiar with Saul's chasing him, and now she's familiar with Samuel anointing him as king. From afar, she's been following David's life, okay? That this be no grief to you, nor offense to your heart, David, either that you will shed blood without a cause. She could have said, David, when you got the news, what my husband said to you, did you pray? Did we read about any prayer of David? No. Did David go out and write a new psalm when he got this news? No, what did he say? Put on your sword, we're gonna go kill him. He hasn't sought any counsel. He hasn't sought God. He hasn't sought a word. He hasn't even sought a sign. All he has looked for is his sword, all right? This is what she's talking about. Because if you avenged yourself, but let the Lord deal with you, and if this happens, David, remember me, your maidservant. Let's see how David responds. So what does he say to her? Blessed is the Lord God of Israel who sent you out here to meet me. And blessed is your adv advice, and blessed are you, because you have kept me this day from coming to bloodshed and from avenging myself with my own hand. For indeed, as the Lord God of Israel lives, who has kept me back from hurting you, unless you had come and hurried and come to meet me, surely by morning light, your house would have been ruins. I would have destroyed it all. Don't tell me one person can't make a difference. So what did he do? He received from her hand what she had brought him, all the food, and said to her, go back in peace, honey. Go back to your house. See, I have listened to your voice, and my friends, this is the first time, or the the earliest point of history in any book of antiquity where a male says this to a woman, I have respected your person. David could have been the first feminist. Here she comes, he listened to her. He didn't even know her name. So, now let's go back to the farm. So now Abigail goes back home to Nabal. 
And there he was, holding a feast in his house, like the feast of a king. And Nabal's heart was very merry. He was so happy. Why? Because he was super drunk. <laughs> Therefore, right? Remember, she's been missing. Where's Abigail? I don't know. She's, I don't know. And then she comes in after a long donkey ride. I don't know about you girls, but would your hair be a little messed up? Would you look a little frazzled? All right, she comes walking in, and look what she says. She tells him nothing, little, or much. What have you been up to? Nothing. What have you been doing? Little. <laughs> huh? Come here. Until the morning light. So it was in the morning when the wine had gone out of Nabal. Ooh, the hangover. Ooh. Honey, I need to tell you about where I was last night during your party. Uh, you know those young men who came to you from David? Uh, I took everything that they needed from our pantry and I took it out to them in the middle of the night. So when he heard this and his wife told him those things, his heart died within him and he became like a stone. Hmm. He didn't even know that stuff was gone. But what does he feel? He feels like she betrayed him, right? And she just died to him. You're dead to me. His heart's like a stone. But it happened 10 days later, the Lord struck Nabal and he died. Most commentators think he had a, this woman gave him a stroke. <sighs> He's a runaway slave. He's an outlaw. And you gave him how much? Two seers of grain, two dressed sheep. Huh. God struck him and killed him. So when David, now back into the wilderness, when David hears that Nabal is dead, look what he says. Blessed be the Lord God. <laughs> who has pleaded the cause of my reproach from the hand of Nabal. How I many you know it ain't our fight to fight. Let the Lord fight and let the Lord avenge you. Let the Lord uphold your integrity. Let the Lord uphold your morality. Let the Lord fight your battles. I know it's hard and I know people say ugly things and things get into your heart, but at times, if you fight e ugly with ugly or evil with evil, you're no worse than the one who started it. Let the Lord avenge your integrity and has kept his servant from evil. Hallelujah. For the Lord has returned that wickedness on that fool's own head. And look at this. Here we go. Don't tell me there was no romantic love in the Bible. Because what does David do immediately? Hey, what was that girl's name who jumped off that donkey? Did you guys, did you guys get her number? I got her number, David. Whoa, let's go. So David sent... And David ain't fooling around. She's beautiful and she's smart. Ding, ding, and she's available. He proposes to take her as his wife. What an interesting little story. When we started the story, David was in the worst predicament of his life. Yes, before everything happened, he was a nobody, but at least he was a safe nobody. Now he's a somebody, but there's a price on his head. He has no provisions. He has a ragtag army that's full of jacked up people. He has a king hellbound on killing him, who's also his father-in-law. He is in a horrible marriage. In fact, his wife back at home, Michelle, will be married off to somebody else, even without a divorce. Her father will do that. Nothing going well. He's slighted, he's gonna take out the vengeance on himself, but instead, woo, he meets somebody. I'm gonna close with this. Two weeks ago, we were in Houston at the Joel Osteen Conference. There was a lot of pastors there. Many I knew, and a lot I did not know, and got to meet and uh, spend time with. One was a pastor named Denny Duran from Shreveport, Louisiana, community church there. I'd heard his name, didn't, wasn't familiar with him. And at the end of one of the day sessions at the pastoral lunch, 
uh, Joel Osteen had Pastor Duran come up for like 10 minutes and just kind of close it out. And he really talked about your future. Because the whole point of the, the two days was supposed to be secession and, and, and whatnot. So he was talking about that and he told a story that really he never wanted to be in ministry. He wanted to be a football coach. And 31 years ago, he had coached from seventh grade, eighth grade football, high school. He got his first paying job at a JC in Louisiana. And how many know football is king in the South? So he's getting, making a little money, not enough really to live on, but it's an opportunity. And his team's doing fairly well, but he's only the special teams coach. And if you don't know football, special teams means the kickoff, you cover it, or the kickoff return, you block for it, the punts, and the punt return, and the extra points, okay? That, that was his area that was under him. And they're doing pretty good. They're playing their last game of the season. If they win, they make the playoffs. It comes to him that there's gonna be recruiters in the crowd, and that was not that big a deal because at junior colleges, the big schools, such as LSU or Louisiana Monroe, or they're always gonna be sitting there because they're gonna approach these JC kids if they have skill and the grades to go play at the big schools. But then he found out, no, the recruiters were not there for the players. There's gonna be three recruiters in the audience that are there nothing but looking at the coaching staffs because these big schools have to, they need coaches as well. So Pastor Duran's like, this is my opportunity. So he goes, but I'd forgotten I'd asked this girl I had met out on a date that day. They even moved the kickoff back an hour and a half, so I had to tell her, can we have a late dinner? Can I pick you up after the game? And she said, yeah, that's fine. So the game starts. He's so excited, he says, and it's tied, and they have to punt, and the punter lets the ball go right through his hands, 15 yards back, big scrum, turnover. The other team goes in for a touchdown. He says, later, we punt, and the guy runs it back for, I mean, he goes, Every, if it could go wrong on my special teams. It went wrong that day. We ended up losing, and you could point at the special teams for losing that game. And he says, I am so, he goes, I could have bit off the head of a nail. I was so just, and it's the last game of the season. We lost, so we don't make the playoffs, and you gotta be all huggy-huggy to everybody. It's the end of the season. He goes, but I was ready to strangle half of them, right? It's just, because you've cost me my future. And now I have to get in my car and take this girl on a date. And I gotta act charming. I'm not feeling very charming. Been a rough day. And he goes, I tell you that story because I've been married to that woman for 31 years. And he goes, that day I thought my future had gone down the toilet. Little did I know my future, the best part of my future was right in front of me. Are we able to discern this? Guys, at the old building on a Friday night, my brother-in-law, well now my brother-in-law, but then my friend Joey, used to play percussions up here, worked with him at Lucky's. He's a Raider fan, I'm a Niner fan. We'd made a bet, I won the bet. I, don't, I think it was lunch or something, and he just, for like a year, he never paid it. And every time he saw me, he goes, oh, I know, I know. <laughs> but he's standing next to this kind of attractive woman. And they talk, and he finishes this conversation. He turns, I go, who is that? And he says, that's my sister. I'd known Joey 12 years. I never even knew he had a sister. And that day in the hallway, I'd gotten divorce papers, my first marriage. I had resigned. I did not feel called to the ministry. Larry Hayashida, God rest his soul, walks in my office, put my resignation sheet on my desk, looked me in the eye and ripped it up and he said, get back to work. And I'll never forget that. It was a really low time in my life. I thought it was just another Friday night. But little did I know, I met my future in the most bizarre circumstances. It's funny, Joey still owes me money for that. <laughs> now that I think about it, he never did pay me for that. For that bet. My friends, I close with this on this Valentine's Day, a day set for love. I don't care what you're going through right now. I don't care what the doctor says. I don't care what the bank says. I don't care what the government says. I don't care what the prosecutor says. I don't care what the divorce court says. I don't care what any of it says. It's all just peripheral. God has got a great future for you, and God's got a better, has relationships coming. If you're single, 
My friends, an Abigail or a David, you're gonna meet. And it might be in the most interesting of circumstances. Might be in the cover at night. Might be a fool brought you together. But can you recognize my future's right in front of me? Because once you can do that, you'll start having hope. You'll start knowing that tomorrow's better than today. And the day after that will be better than that day. Yes, there'll be challenges. But our God gives us a better tomorrow, my friends. Look around. If you are married and your Abigail or your David is sitting next to you, this would be a good time to reach over and grab their, their hand. Amen? Look them in the eye and say, honey, happy Valentine's Day. You're my David. You're my Abigail. If you're single, just look down the aisle and find somebody for right now. I don't wanna kill the, I don't wanna kill the moment.